Beautiful day in the neighborhood. Reaction Beanie Yo 546. Day in the neighborhood. My brothers and sisters. It is that time to get into another one of these true crime, horror, dark, deep, and mysterious what the is going on type of videos. And today, we are going back to the man that I like to call the lazy man. None other than Lazy Masquerade. Back to Lazy Masquerade, y'all. And the title of the video is When the Killers Are Caught on CCTV. Dot, dot, dot. Now, I don't like the title of this uh, video, y'all, because I feel like the lazy man is telling us in this title that these killers are going to be caught on CCTV but they still won't get away with it. You know what I'm saying, man? I feel like we're about to go down another rabbit hole of unsolved freaking mysteries. Long story short, short story long. But I don't know. I don't know. But we're about to see. But before we see my brothers and sisters, y'all know what y'all got to do? Get whatever you may need. Get what you need, please. We back to the lazy. Masquerade. Y'all got what y'all need, y'all ready to go. Then let's in go. In today's video, I'll be going over two unsolved mysteries that have received very little media coverage. I want to draw attention to them because I believe that they can be solved if the CCTV evidence reaches the right people. Today's video is sponsored by Raycon. Lazy would hit commercial early, y'all, but did I just say that, man? Two unsolved mysteries. We about to go down two different rabbit holes of unsolved freaking mysteries. But I feel the lazy man though saying that he want to bring awareness to this, so hopefully one day they can be uh freaking solved. So let's go. This was Scott Rattigan, an outgoing, friendly, and popular 24-year-old, described by those who knew him as a guy who lived and laughed harder than anyone. Scott, to be or not to be? To be. <laughs> a lifelong sportsman who grew up playing football and lacrosse in Gainesville, Virginia, Scott was both athletic and intelligent, having earned a degree in business management from Radford University. Always driven to succeed, he even became vice president of the Sigma Chi fraternity there. In 2018, Scott finished college and relocated to Arlington, a short drive from his hometown. There, he moved into a two-bedroom apartment with his sister, located in the East Tower of Ava Bolston Square, an upscale complex that was home to almost a thousand residents, mostly young professionals who worked in and around the densely populated business district. In June 2018, Scott worked briefly as a recruiter for Insight Global, and then, in March 2019, landed himself a well-paying job as an account executive at Konica Minolta Business Solutions a company with offices in 49 countries worldwide that specialise in manufacturing laser printers, copiers, and other industrial imaging products. Scott's branch was situated just over the Potomac River in the national capital, Washington DC. For a recent graduate, Scott was already living a particularly comfortable life. He was financially secure, had a broad social circle, and was still dating his longtime high school girlfriend. Although they'd been on and off over the course of their almost 10 year relationship, as couples who meet early in life often are, by the time Scott moved to Arlington, they were very much committed to each other and had a good relationship. On the morning. So far, so good for Scott. So far, so good. On Friday, January 17th, 2020, Scott and his sister chatted over their morning coffee, as they always did. It was then that Scott reminded his sister he was taking the day off. 
It was going to be a long weekend, with Monday being Martin Luther King Day, and Scott wanted to maximise his break. After finishing breakfast, Scott's sister set off for work as per usual. What Scott planned to get up to during his day off remains unknown, though it's believed he had made plans with his sister and some guests for later that evening. At 5pm, Scott's sister returned to their high-rise apartment. Upon entering the residence, she was immediately hit by the smell of a cleaning solution. Nothing appeared out of place though, aside from the fact that Scott was nowhere to be seen. Concerned she couldn't get a hold of her brother, she made her way into Scott's bedroom 20 to 29 minutes later to see if he was asleep. There, she discovered Scott completely unresponsive in his bed. Damn. At 5.29pm, Scott's sister called 911 and a dispatcher summoned help. It's going to be for a 24-year-old male with blood coming from his mouth, hands and neck. No weapons were seen. There are a total of four people in the apartment. Also noted that it smells like bleach. As mentioned by the operator, there were four people inside the apartment total when the call was placed. One was, of course, Scott's sister, and though I've seen conflicting reports, it's believed the other three were her friends. None of them are considered suspects. Okay, none of them considered suspects, but are y'all thinking what I'm thinking? Is it his girlfriend? Like, I don't know why it would be his girlfriend right now. You know what I'm saying? We really don't have no evidence of it being her. Then they had been together for a long time, over 10 years on and off. But, I mean, who else could it have been? I don't know. Let's find out. Paramedics quickly arrived and pronounced Scott dead at the scene. The law enforcement initially announced that they'd been called to attend a cardiac arrest. Scott's demise had obviously not occurred naturally. He had sustained trauma to the upper body and though his exact COD has yet to be released, an autopsy by the office of the chief medical examiner ruled the death a homicide, evidenced by both the defensive wounds on Scott's hands and the fact that someone had gone to extreme lengths to clean up the crime scene using bleach. Other than the killer's DNA and weapon, nothing was reported missing from Scott's apartment, and all of his valuables were accounted for, including his mobile phone. Despite Scott's neighbour two doors down being home when the incident took place, she didn't report hearing any unusual noises coming from his apartment. Few other details were revealed about Scott's case in the immediate aftermath, with the authorities remaining tight-lipped to preserve the integrity of their investigation. Ahead of the one-year anniversary of Scott's death, however, Arlington County Police released external surveillance images of a person of interest, or POI, who was seen in the area both before and after the murder. Mm. Okay, now that look like a male to me. That look like a male to me, y'all. It's hard to tell, you know what I'm saying, with all the clothes that they got on. But I think that's a male, so that maybe rules the girlfriend out. I don't know. But this, whoever this is in this uh, CCTV footage, they do look like they got something to do with it. They do look freaking suspicious, man. All I'm saying. Let's go. The ACPD actually released these videos out of order, but I've ordered them chronologically here. I've also run the footage through a video enhancement tool to make it clearer. The first two clips, which were captured before the incident, show the POI walking north on Randolph Street towards the main entrance of the Ava Bolston complex, keeping his head down, moving with purpose, and concealing something inside the pouch of his hoodie. The subsequent two clips show him running in the opposite direction, one block south of the complex, before crossing in the opposite direction of the metro, suggesting he fled the scene by car, bike, bus, or on foot. Washington DC and its surrounding areas are the second most surveilled place in the states, with almost 56 cameras per thousand people. Given the prevalence of CCTV in the area, there's likely more footage of the POI making his getaway that is yet to be released to the public. Mm. Arlington PD described this mystery man as a, quote, white male, approximately 5 feet 6 inches to 5 feet 8 inches tall, weighing 150 to 175 pounds, dressed in all black, carrying a black backpack and walking with his feet turned inward, often referred to as a pigeon-toed gait. 
as well as a consistent pigeon toed stride. The POI also appears to be bow legged, a skeletal condition which causes the lower legs to be angled inward. Forensic podiatrists are confident that the POI's leg and feet conditions are genuine and not faked or exaggerated for the camera. Mm-hmm. If you don't agree, then try walking with your feet like that for a while. It's not easy, and it only gets harder when you try running. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, a disproportionate number of gifted athletes are pigeon toed, something worth bearing in mind. Mm. The POI went to great lengths to hide his identity. He placed a strip of black tape on his backpack, concealing the brand logo, and wore a balaclava or neck gaiter to hide his face. It's worth remembering that this incident occurred in mid-January 2020, well before facial coverings became a common sight in the US. That being said, this balaclava-like covering may not have appeared too suspicious since temperatures that afternoon were around the 2 to 3 degrees Celsius mark, or 36 to 37 degrees Fahrenheit. From the little we can make out, the POI appears to have a nose with a prominent, narrow dorsum. Though some people online believe the POI is actually a woman based on their body shape, I personally don't see it, and law enforcement are adamant that this is a male. I doubt that and I agree with the lazy man and the law enforcement, the police man. I think that's a freaking male, y'all. I think this is a freaking male. But I also just want to point out the fact that I, this before we got to keep in mind that this before the whole uh, C word outbreak and all that. He got on all black with uh, the nose covering and stuff. And okay, you can uh, make the argument that it's cold outside. Okay, so we can make that argument. But regardless, long story short, story long, regardless of all that, if they was to freaking um, bring somebody in who walked pigeon toed, or you tell this uh, one of the suspects that you bring in to run, and they start running like that guy, it's him. You know what I'm saying, man? Because he can hide his face and do all that. But you can't hide the way you was running. Like, that's a very unique walk and run that this person have because of the pigeon toedness. I know that ain't a word, but I know y'all know what I'm saying. Let's keep going. Let's state that definitively if they weren't certain. Perhaps the perp wasn't so thorough when he bleached the apartment, using bleach which he may have been carrying in this water bottle. Mm. Perhaps forensic investigators did find some of his DNA at the scene, and confirm the POI to be a male. Also, notice his flat chest. I'm inclined to agree that this is a man. As you can see, there are no timestamps on any of this surveillance footage released to the public, and still keeping their cards close to their chest, Arlington PD haven't confirmed when exactly these images were captured. Scott was last seen in his apartment on the morning of January 17th, and was last heard from at around 1pm when he responded to messages from friends, give or take 20 minutes or so. Given that his sister contacted emergency services at 5.29pm, that leaves a four and a half hour window in which somebody entered Scott's apartment, took his life, and then bleached away the evidence before escaping. But we can actually narrow that window down further. Mm. Fellow YouTuber Aaron Stoner has done a detailed analysis of this footage over on his channel, which I highly recommend you check out via the links in the description. Using the direction of the shadows in these images as a guide, and calculating the angle of the sun throughout the day on January 17th, 2020, he estimates that the hooded figure was seen making his way towards Scott's complex between 10.31 and 11.31am, and was seen fleeing between 12.40 and 12.50pm. If correct, that means one of three things. That Scott's friends were wrong about the last time they've been in contact with him? That this man has mistakenly been singled out as a person of interest? Or, most chillingly, that the killer used his victim's phone to text his friends shortly before leaving the apartment? Oh my god, man! See, now we going down the freaking rabbit hole for real, y'all. This just made it so much more complicated. If that dude, I can't remember his name, Aaron Stoner, I don't know, man, but the, the, the dude who done did all the calculations with just by looking at the sun and, um, you know, the shadows and all that and just uh going off his time or what he believed the time to be at those certain times, you know what I'm saying? If that was to be true, then this Max figure came and freaking murdered all uh, uh, the guy even earlier than the last time he was reported talking to his friend and now we gotta think about is the friends lines do they know what they're going on now i gotta look at the friends a little more sideways like are y'all sure y'all telling me all the truth like it, it just opened up a whole new can of worms man just by his calculations of when he think that this guy was caught on cctv footage let's go 
users on WebSleuth.com have made some interesting observations about the POI's attire. His entire ninja-like outfit was made up of branded items. Though the suspect covered the logo on his backpack with duct tape, it's since been identified as the popular North Face Recon, perhaps one with a custom logo worth concealing. It's not uncommon for employers at three-letter companies to provide their staff with bags and other items with company logos, for instance. Similarly, the suspect's hoodie is also likely from North Face. His shoes appear to be Nike freeruns, with the signature swoosh blacked out, and his gloves are from Under Armour. All of his clothes appear to be in good, or even mink condition, with the soles of his shoes being completely clean, and there being no visible marks on the rest of his stealth kit. In total, this outfit would have easily cost him more than $500, and it's entirely possible that he had replicas in his backpack to change into before leaving the apartment, a theory supported by these two stealths. The one on the left shows the POI before the attack, and the one on the right, after. Notice how the black patch on his left shoe disappears. Though this could have just been a flaw in the recording, it's worth considering that he may have swapped out his bloody clothes for fresh ones. Yeah. Regardless, the POI was clearly willing to dispose of at least one costly outfit. That strongly suggests that this individual is either independently wealthy, or have been paid a large amount of money to either steal a specific item from Scott's home, or to end his life. Question is, why? Scott why? was a clean-cut, well-liked person, described by friends and family as the sweetest guy on earth, and though those close to him have racked their brains, nobody can think of a single person who would wish harm upon him. The way I, and most people following this case see it, there are only a handful of possible scenarios that explain the killer's actions. Let's go over them. Scenario 1. This was a burglary gone wrong. Like his sister, Scott would normally have been at work at the time of the incident. An intruder may have somehow managed to gain access to their apartment with the intent of raiding it for cash, expecting the property to be empty, only to come face to face with Scott himself. It's worth remembering that nothing had been stolen from the home, at least nothing that the authorities have announced. It's also worth bearing in mind that the POI was relatively small, and Scott was an athlete. In a sudden one-on-one, -on -one, my money would have been on Scott, unless of course the intruder caught him sleeping. But then why take his life? Though we can't rule this out as being a botched robbery, most of the evidence points towards Scott's murder being premeditated. Scenario 2 this was an entirely random act of violence. Someone had set their heart on taking another person's life, decided it would be someone who lived in Ava Bolston's East Tower, and Scott just happened to be the unlucky victim. Not only does that sound completely far-fetched, but Arlington PD were quick to announce that there was no further risk to the general public, strongly suggesting this wasn't a random incident, but a targeted one. Scenario 3. This was a case of mistaken identity. Scott had no known enemies, so although this wasn't a random attack, it's possible his killer targeted the wrong apartment. But that too seems improbable to me. Even if the suspect was a paid hitman who had never met Scott, they had obviously spent days, weeks, or perhaps even months planning this job. Their actions that afternoon convinced me that whoever took Scott's life was both competent and well prepared. I don't believe yeah. they'd make such a schoolboy error. Given that a directory machine with each resident's name and door number was also accessible in the building's front vestibule, it's even more unlikely that he would have confused Scott with someone else. I'm also inclined to believe that this attack was personal, and was carried out by someone who knew Scott, or had gotten to know him. Someone who wouldn't mistake him for anyone else. Which brings us to the main working hypothesis. Scenario 4. Scott did have an enemy. One who wanted him out of the picture. A love rival. A business rival. Someone from Scott's past. Someone who held a grudge. Someone that not even his closest friends and family knew about. Perhaps even someone interested in his girlfriend. Whoever it was though, they knew that Scott was home alone that afternoon, and seized that opportunity to take his life. But unless Scott had divulged that he was taking the 17th off well in advance, it seems improbable that the POI would have been so well prepared. And this guy was most certainly ready to roll that morning, given his clothes, confidence, and knowledge of the building's layout. They knew Scott was taking that Friday off at least a few days in advance, and so must have either been close with Scott, or one of Scott's co-workers or friends, or had access to his company's shift calendar. 
whichever scenario you subscribe to. The killer would have still needed to gain access to both the Ava Bolston complex and Scott's apartment. According to numerous anecdotal reports I've read online, despite being a luxury apartment complex with high rental prices, security at Ava Bolston Square was extremely lax around the time of Scott's slaying. Mm. There weren't any cameras above the ground floor, and even those were down on the day of the incident due to refurbishments. The entrances do require a fob to gain access, but according to residents, it's a huge building with a constant stream of people going in and out. Piggybacking in would have been extremely easy. Another fellow YouTuber, Sloan, demonstrated just how easy it still is to gain access to the building as a non-resident. So, where exactly in the Ava Bolston building was Scott's apartment? Well, this photo of his sister shows her on their balcony. White bricks can be seen on the floor above. Looking at the exterior of the building, I believe their apartment may have been located somewhere on the 20th floor. Damn! That means the POI would have needed to use the elevator. Though, as demonstrated by Sloan, the ones inside the Ava Bolston building didn't require a fob to use. Okay, so it's pretty clear as day that it was easy to get to um to this dude apartment. You know what I'm saying, man? It was not hard to get into it. Just like um, I know some of y'all will know what I'm talking about when I say this. Apartment complexes. You know how some apartment complexes got like gates or they got the little things and you know you gotta use your key cards or whatever. But it's still so easy to still get into there because all you gotta do is wait till somebody else come through and they gonna let you in. You know what I'm saying? When they go through, it's almost that type of vibe, man. But all I got to say is, man, I'm going with the last theory that the lazy man said. I believe that this was an organized hit on Scott. You know, like, it, whoever did this, they planned it out. They knew him. This was not no mistaken identity or none of that craziness. They knew what they was going to go do. They did it. They cleaned up and they left. And I really do believe whoever did it was the person with the all black on both Old leg pigeon toe walking and running down the street on the CCTV footage. I do think that. Let's go. It's clear that entering the Ava Bolston building wouldn't have been a challenge for the perpetrator, but we still need to consider how he got inside Scott's apartment. Did he have a copy of Scott's key or a master key? Did he force an entry? Had Scott left his door unlocked? Or did Scott willingly open the door? Perhaps the POI removed his mask at the door, and Scott recognized him through the people as someone he trusted. Someone who caught him off guard inside. Perhaps Scott had invited someone over while he had the apartment to himself, and opened the door for an expected guest. Who that may have been is the subject of much speculation. If they were a close friend, or even a known acquaintance of Scott's, surely they would have been identified by now. Some have speculated whether there was an aspect of Scott's life which he kept secret from even those closest to him. Whether there are rumours floating around online that this POI may have been a dealer of some sort paying a home visit, there's absolutely no evidence that Scott was involved in anything shady or sordid, and his father has specifically stated that Scott's case is not drug related. In one of Scott's friend's words, Scott was not a druggie, and he did not deal drugs either. Scott was honestly one of the best human beings. The sweetest soul, didn't have a mean bone in his body, and was loved by everyone that ever met him. Which is what makes his murder so devastating, confusing, and frustrating. So, who had an incentive to kill Scott? An inoffensive white-collar worker who lived a low-risk lifestyle and who got along with everyone? That's what we need to find out. To review the profile of our suspect, we're looking for an affluent, intelligent, and athletic Caucasian male familiar with Bolston, Arlington, who stands around 5 feet 6 and 5 feet 8, who weighed around 150 to 175 pounds at the time, who walks with a pigeon toe gait, who has or had a penchant for North Face products, and whose whereabouts are unaccounted for on the early afternoon of Friday, January 17th, 2020. And yet, despite possessing so many distinctive characteristics, the killer's identity, and by extension, their motive, remains unknown. That's likely because this case received so little media coverage, overshadowed by global events that occurred shortly after, 
and because the authorities took a full year to release this footage to the public. That is crazy. The Rattigan man. family is offering a $50,000 reward for any information that leads to a conviction. Did you live in or around Arlington in early 2020? Do you know anyone who fits this profile? Perhaps a co-worker who took the morning off on January 17th. Perhaps a person who was acting strangely around that same time period. Whoever took Scott's life must be held accountable. If you, a friend, or a loved one have any idea who the person in this footage might be, please get in touch with the ACPD tip line. You can also make a report anonymously through the Crime Solvers hotline. All that contact information is on screen now. Man, that's a tough one, y'all. That is a freaking tough unsolved mystery because I got to keep it real. I, I, I really don't think it will ever be solved because there is like damn near zero information about that guy that we see on that CCTV footage. Like there is not enough evidence at all, man. But I really do think this, whoever did this really knew Scott. I really, I think Scott knew them that, and he trusted them more than likely and all that. And for some reason that we'll never know they wanted to kill him, but he'll go. Well, I, I do feel a, my, my 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 more positive vibe coming out or whatever may have you i think lazy man putting out this video may potentially y'all solve this crime and just just the reason why man because lazy man get millions of freaking views he he telling you what is happening and all that and hopefully somebody who lived in that area during that time four years ago in 2020 um can recount this or remember seeing this man in the black you know what i'm saying and this the thing that gonna make it stand out more than anything the freaking pigeon toe walking if you live in that area and you know anybody who walk or run like that please contact the lazy man the police or whatever you know what i'm saying so i'm holding on to maybe the lazy man can help solve this case i see why he said that at the beginning man shout out to the freaking lazy man but that's crazy y'all that was a crazy one well i'm just left like i really don't know what the freak i don't know who to believe that actually killed him but rest in peace scott man only 25 years old rest in peace let's go the lazy This is South Ogden, a small city in Weber County, Utah. Situated in a residential neighborhood, just a four minute drive from the busy thoroughfare of Washington Boulevard is 3636 Ogden Avenue. Back in 2016, the residence was home to 24 year old construction worker, Carl Van Komen. Described as a free spirit with a fierce loyalty to family and friends, Carl was a charismatic and authentic young man who loved nothing more than spending time with the people he cared about most exploring nature and indulging in his greatest passion, ice hockey. At the time, Carl was renting 3636 with his brother Brock, their stepbrother, and their friend, Jay. Known as something of a party palace by locals, the house had attracted police attention twice for noise offences, but for the most part, all of the tenants got along well with their neighbours, especially with the man who lived alone in 3630, their immediate neighbour, 61-year-old Kevin Nelson a former local business owner and recent retiree who spent most of his time collecting records, playing guitar, and cheering on the Denver Broncos. Kevin would frequently visit the Van Komen Brothers & Co to hang out and share nuggets of wisdom with the young whippersnappers next door, who all playfully referred to him as Grandpa Nelson. I'm not that old, damn it, Kevin would retort. <laughs> he and Carl were especially close. Being a social guy himself, Kevin was well liked by all of the other residents on Ogden Avenue respected for his kind heart and down-to-earth nature. December 9th, 2016 was a freezing cold day in Weber County, with temperatures dropping to minus 3 degrees Celsius, or about 27 degrees Fahrenheit. By the time the sun set, most people were keeping warm indoors, and at 7pm, so were all four members of 3636 Ogden Avenue. I've read reports that a fifth person, B, was also at the house with them, though the sources are unclear whether he was also a tenant, or if he was simply a friend visiting. Regardless, the temperature was low, but spirits in the house were high, 
and the boys agreed it was worth braving the cold to have some fun on a Friday night. After a few minutes of deliberation, the group decided to go bowling together, though before they set off, Brock and his stepbrother wanted to grab a bite to eat. Not having much disposable cash to begin with, and wanting to save the little they had for Christmas gifts, the pair opted to buy some Hot Pockets from a nearby store. They set off at 7.45pm, leaving Kyle, Jay, and B behind at the house. Around that same time, Kevin Nelson was walking home after a get-together with some local friends. Hearing that his neighbours were inside 3636, Kevin wandered over, and was duly welcomed inside by Kyle. What happened next is every sibling's worst nightmare. Brock and his stepbrother returned from the store just ten minutes later, and somehow, in that brief window of time, all hell had broken loose inside 3636 Ogden Avenue. In the living room, they found their brother, Kyle, and their neighbour, Kevin, lying in pools of blood, both having been shot, one of them execution style. Their killer, or killers, were nowhere to be seen. Lying in the snow-laden backyard was 20-year-old Jay, whose name's been withheld for his security. He had been shot through the neck, but was still alive. Little information has been publicly revealed about B. He either managed to escape the scene, or had left the house just before the slaughter began. But either way, the authorities don't consider him a suspect in the case. Man, I feel like this is one of those ones where everybody will suspect. In a way, you know what I'm saying? It could be, well, I'm not really going to say it could be Jay. And it's not the old man, I can't remember their names, y'all. The old man or the uh, younger guy who got shot and killed in the uh, living room. But I'm saying B could be a suspect, and I'm going to throw this out here too. At this point right now, I can't even believe uh, the two brothers that went to the store and got the hot pockets. Y'all suspects and buys, man. Y'all might be telling me lies. Y'all might be the ones who did this ain't no telling y'all here we go down another rabbit hole and i'm pretty sure it's only gonna get even crazier let's go help was summoned at 7 58 p.m brock then called his father jerry john and told him that kyle was gone their father asked how he knew that brock replied because he's in my arms medics arrived shortly thereafter and pronounced kyle and kevin DOA. Jay was rushed to a local hospital for treatment. That evening, police locked down the area around the crime scene, halting traffic in the neighbourhood and conducting a door-to-door -door canvas for information. Surprisingly, none of their neighbours heard or saw anything. Officers searched neighbouring yards throughout most of the night, expanding their search until the morning hours. Crime scene investigators remained on the property until Saturday evening, scouring each room for evidence. Several casings from a 9mm were collected for examination. A number of footprint impressions were identified, and a bloody fingerprint impression was found on the front door. Jay would thankfully make a full physical recovery, but told officers that he didn't recognise any of the intruders, nor had he ever heard any of their voices before. He did, however, describe how they had approached him while he was smoking outside in the backyard, catching him off guard just before they stormed the property. He recalled they were demanding money, and then everything went black. Investigators believe that at least one of the housemates, likely Kyle, was specifically targeted by these unknown assailants. They initially had a suspect in mind too, one who lived near the Van Komen household, but this individual had a watertight alibi. As mentioned, the Van Komen house had a reputation for being a party pad, and it was no secret that their friends would often go there to drink beer and smoke dope. This was never anything serious, and none of the housemates sold anything illicit, only indulged in it recreationally, but South Ogden PD knew that a potential tipster might be worried about coming forward because of that. If someone with information is reluctant to come forward because they participated in less serious offences, either at the home or with the victims, know that we are focused on homicide. Do not let concern about a prior potential offence keep you from coming forward. We're not concerned about it, and neither should you be. Yeah, like seriously, man, the damn police ain't worried about if y'all used to smoke weed together. You know what I'm saying, man? They want some freaking information. Despite their pleas for information, though, few leads presented themselves. Four days after the incident, the authorities released the most crucial and unsettling evidence that they had come across in a press release. 
three video clips captured from external security cameras around 3636 Ogden Avenue. The first piece of footage shows the three suspects lurking in the darkness outside the Van Komen household. Suspect 1 appears to be a tall and slim man, dressed in a light-coloured jacket, light pants, a hat, and what's been described as a paintball mask, with a duffel bag slung over his shoulder and a gun in his hand. Suspect 2 wears a thicker, light-coloured coat, dark snow trousers, a darker mask, and a backpack. Based on their stature and mannerisms, this could be a female, but let me know what you think down below. I think the one in the black pants is a female lazy man. What y'all think, man? I think I think that's a male that's uh like kind of like uh what you want to say kneeling. He not kneeling, what he uh y'all know what I'm saying, man. I don't know the word, but the one in the black pants, I think that may be a female. I don't know, but it seems like we finna go down the road again, on the road again of unsolved mysteries where we really don't got a lot of clues, man. Jesus Christ. Suspect three, seemingly another male, donned a darker outfit, a plastic mask, and what appears to be a light colored neck gaiter or equivalent covering. Unfortunately, there are no timestamps to go along with any of these recordings, so it's not known how quickly the three masked invaders struck after Brock and his stepbrother left the scene, but the authorities have since stated that the trio had been staking out the home for at least an hour before the incident. The next clip shows Suspect 1 peering in through the property's windows, observing their soon-to-be victims' movements. Suspect 2 joins Suspect 1. Suspect 3's position at this point is unknown. The two voyeurs make their way to the back of the property. According to the police, this final video was captured shortly after Carl and Kevin had been slain. In it, we can see a vehicle drive down the road. And that's probably them in the vehicle, man. But this is like some real life movie ish. You know what I'm saying? Like this is real life movie ish, especially when you know the outcome of what happened to uh the people in that house that these whoever they was is literally in their yard looking through their windows and stuff. Man, that man, life is life is a movie, and movie is life. It's not clear whether this was Brock and his stepbrother returning from the store a getaway vehicle for the suspects to escape in, or a vehicle unrelated to the case. But law enforcement opted to include it in their press release, so it may be significant. Seconds after the vehicle passes, suspect one leaps over a fence, looks up and down the road, places something inside his bag, and jumps back over the fence the way he had come. The fuck? Law enforcement were hopeful that by releasing these images, someone would recognize the three suspects. And yet, nobody did. 
And, and I, I, I can't blame nobody for uh, not really being able to recognize them. But I just want to point out that this one is very similar to the first one, y'all, as far as, like, it seems like this was a hit, just like the first one. Like, these people, I don't know if they was going another kill as many of the people they can, or they just had this one person that they wanted to kill, and everybody else was just going to be a, a casualty to a casualty casualty <laughs> casualty to them murdering him you know what i'm saying whoever they target was but it seemed like these killers knew what they wanted to do and they went and did it this was planned out this was premeditated murder it's frustrating that there's so much evidence as we can't find them said carl's mother renee finch though she's also expressed her gratitude that brock and his stepbrother were out at the time of the incident we're very thankful that we didn't lose all three of our boys that night. Since there are so few details about this case online, I'd like to try and analyse these clips in more detail. This is a satellite view of the area where the crime unfolded. Running horizontally along the bottom is Ogden Avenue, and horizontally along the top is Adams Avenue. 36th Street and 37th Street run perpendicular. Highlighted here is 3636 Ogden Avenue, aka the crime scene. Beside it is Kevin Nelson's property, 3630. According to online sources, the three videos were captured in order from Kevin's own security cameras. Mm. Looking at the first clip, camera 03 caught the suspects observing 3636 from behind a tree. I've seen a few people online suggest that this may have been one of these two trees, but that's demonstrably untrue. Not only is this area way too open, but you'll notice that the tree in the footage has a split in it, with one thick branch splitting off from the trunk. Neither of these trees are a match. It's more likely that they were observing their targets from this wooded area behind the two houses. Yeah. This area would have offered them far more cover than any trees by the roadside, and it makes sense that Kevin would have placed a camera at the rear of his property for protection. Going back to our satellite view, you may be able to notice that there's a 200 meter dirt track that runs between the houses on Ogden Avenue's north side and Adams Avenue's south side. I believe the three suspects used this track to approach the property. There wouldn't have been any surveillance cameras along it. The track is also wide enough for a vehicle to drive through. Mm. They may have been dropped off at either side, or could have even parked their getaway vehicle somewhere along the track. Next, notice how long suspect one stays in a crouch position, and then effortlessly gets up. Not only is he physically fit, but I believe that he and his accomplices were under 30 years old, probably closer to 20. Now look at his mask. Notice how the nose juts out. Ogden PD described this as a paintball mask, but I can't help but wonder whether it's a hockey mask. Given Carl's love for ice hockey, could this have been someone that he encountered on the rink? Mm. Camera O2's position is a lot more clear cut. It was installed on the left side of Kevin Nelson's property. In fact, you can see it right here. Notice how the drain pipe juts out in front of the camera, as it does in the footage. The angle is also the same, focused on the right hand side of 3636. In the footage, suspects 1 and 2 emerge from the back of the property, confirming, in my mind, that they were observing the house from the wooded area in the rear. Suspect 3 doesn't appear in the footage. He or she may have been the designated getaway driver and was waiting for the accomplices inside the vehicle. Jay also mentioned that he was held up by the intruders in the backyard area. Suspect 3 may have been holding Jay there, whilst 1 and 2 spied through the windows. Yeah. The third clip shows Suspect 1 jumping a fence after the slings. The suspect's mask is clearly lifted up at this point and resting atop his head, giving us a very vague impression of his facial features. A very bold or very stupid move. I've enhanced a few stills here, and though it's difficult to make much out, the suspect appears to have a large or long nose. I don't know, man. It's still hard to tell who the hell this dude is, even without his mask from this uh, footage that we got. But I pretty much agree with everything the lazy man is saying about how 
they uh approach the property through that little trailway you know what i'm saying that little alleyway trailway i believe that's how they approach the property i believe they was on they was on in the backyard they went in the front yard you know what i'm saying as far as like what we can see in the first um cctv footage that we got and then um I also believe it's pretty much plausible that when we see those two guys without the third guy, the third guy probably already had Jay hemmed up in the backyard while they was on the side of the house. He probably already was hemmed up or probably already dead. Ain't no telling, man, but I'm I'm pretty much agreeing with everything the lazy man saying other than when he said, um, Talking about their age, talking about they probably like 20 years old. I don't know, man, because we can't see nothing from them, man. I do believe they younger than older, but they may be 20, 30, maybe even 40. I don't know. Let's go. Judging by how he looks up and down the road and stands around in an unsure fashion, I believe Suspect 1 was looking for someone at this point. Yeah. Following this clip, the three accomplices presumably escaped together. It's worth noting that US Route 89, a major highway, runs alongside Ogden Avenue and would have allowed the Gang of Three to put some quick distance between themselves and the crime scene. But this is where things take a turn. You see, according to online sources, this third video, like the other two, was captured by a camera on Kevin Nelson's property, 3630 Ogden Avenue. But I can prove that's not the case. Hmm? Note the two small horizontal windows that run along the lower portion of this building. Neither of the victim's homes have those. Then there's the way that this lighter section juts out slightly from the darker, lower section. The white panelling on this house with the camera. The roof shapes. The fence that the suspect leaps over. The chain link fence that runs between the two houses. This dry, bush-like feature. The tire tracks. The position of the homes opposite. The fact that this footage lacks a camera number in the bottom right like the other two videos. All of the elements are different. This video was 100% recorded by a surveillance camera on a different house in the area. Wow. One ran somewhere else after the incident. But where? I spent hours exploring the length and breadth of Ogden Avenue, searching for a pair of houses that match these two to figure out where the footage was captured. I wanted to find two adjacent homes that matched those in the third video. Thankfully, all of the homes are idiosyncratic, with distinct and unique features, but even after scrutinizing all of them, I just couldn't find a match. I went to bed feeling a little deflated, but that following morning, I realized I may have been searching the wrong place. One road across from Ogden, on the opposite side of the track, you'll find 3677 and 3683 Adams Avenue. Notice how all of their elements are exactly the same as those seen in the security footage. Yeah. The, windows, the slight jutting of the house. The white panelling. The shape of the roofs. The chain link bends. The same dry bushes. The tire tracks. The homes opposite. Whoa. This is most definitely where the third clip was recorded. It is, man. Shout out to the lazy man. The lazy man out here putting in his investigational work. You know what I'm saying, man? Yes, that is where that third uh, footage was took place from, man. But, but what in the end does that mean? Let's see. But shout out to the lazy man for that. Yes, he found where that took place at. And the camera? It's right there. Wow. I've mapped it. And we now know that Suspect 1 ran 160 meters and leapt three fences immediately after raiding Carl's home. He then stood looking up and down Adams Avenue for the better part of 30 seconds, and then returned the way he had come. But why? Well, I have a few ideas. Please bear in mind, this is all speculative, and I'd love to hear your theories too, so please leave them in the comments. Scenario 1 we know the home invasion began after Brock and his stepbrother left for the store, so the trio either took that opportunity to strike because the tenants no longer had a strong numbers advantage, or because the suspects didn't want Brock and or his stepbrother present during the incident. Maybe mm. because one of them would have recognized them, for example. As we know, Brock and his stepbrother were only gone for 10 minutes. The entire raid was conducted in that extremely brief window of time. Assuming there were a few minutes of observation, discussion and hesitation before the breach, 
it may well have only lasted a few minutes. So, picture this. The trio are startled by Brock's sudden reappearance. His vehicle pulls up outside the property, fight or flight kicks in, and the three suspects scatter out the back entrance like rats on a sinking ship. In a panic, suspect two and three take off in their getaway vehicle, leaving suspect one stranded and alone. Hmm. He then makes his way along this dirt track and calls or messages his accomplices for a pickup. He hears a car pass along Adams Avenue and leaps the fence to check if it's his comrades. While he nervously stands around, suspects two and three come to their senses and message him to meet them back on the track. If correct, the vehicle in this footage may have been them returning to the west entrance of said track. In this scenario, Brock and his stepbrother miss the intruders by seconds. That's crazy. Scenario two. Hey, scenario one, that's a great theory, lazy man. I'm rocking with it. The plan initially was just to hold Carl and his roommates up and steal their money, dope, or both. Inside, though, something goes wrong. The tenants resist, or won't comply, or Kyle recognizes one of them, or nerves get the better of them. Whatever the reason, Suspect 1 ends up shooting someone. In a panic, Suspect 2 and 3 scatter, leaving Suspect 1 to fend for himself. 1 finishes off the remaining victims, realizes he's been abandoned, and tries to make contact with his partners in crime. He's then picked up, or flees on foot. I personally do think it's possible that Carl tried to protect his friends, prompting someone to open fire. As his uncle would later state, Kyle would stand up for people. If someone took a run at someone, he would be right there. He was only 5'5 five five or 5'6, five but he acted like he was 7 feet tall in those situations. Hmm. Scenario 3. There was a fourth accomplice, a designated getaway driver, but he wasn't waiting in the correct location after the raid. Suspect 1 went looking for him, while suspects 2 and 3 waited on the track. Scenario 4 The reports vary. Many of them mention B, the friend or other tenant, being present at 3636 when the raid occurred. B reportedly escaped the scene on foot without being hit. If true, then this footage could have an even darker context. Namely, that Suspect 1 was attempting to hunt down B before he could get away and summon help. Mm. Unable to find him, Suspect 1 returned to his accomplices. If we can get some confirmation whether B was at the house when this all went down, I'd be inclined to call this the most likely explanation. Yeah. The last thing I want to examine is the vehicle that drives along Adams Avenue. Depending on whether it was the suspect's getaway vehicle or not completely changes the context of the video. Interestingly, yeah. we get a decent look at its silhouette when it passes in front of this white car. Judging by its outline, it appears to be a dark-coloured 4x4 truck. You can make out the front portion, which dips down into the bed here. Revisiting the Van Komen household on Google Maps, we can see that in August 2015, a black or dark grey Nissan Titan was parked in their driveway. Wow. The fact that a very similar vehicle passes along Adams Avenue in this footage is striking to me. Yeah, I ain't even put all that together, lazy man. Because the first time I seen the uh pickup uh truck, I like I knew it was a truck that passed by in the uh what that was the third and last uh video that we got as far as like uh CCTV footage. You know what I'm saying? It looked like a truck, man. But yeah, I never put it together that it's the same. It, it looked like the same damn truck that's in the driveway from the damn Google Maps. That's crazy. And it could of course be a coincidence. With a fellow neighbor yeah. or passerby having a similar looking truck. But if this vehicle in the driveway belonged to Brock Van Komen or his stepbrother, then this footage could show the two returning from the store moments after the suspects fled the house. Yeah. Indeed, one of the perps may have asked the victims where Brock and his stepbrother had gone. And when told that they had popped to so and so store for a minute, suspect one may have gone on the lookout. There is, however, another possibility that the truck in this footage didn't belong to Brock or his stepbrother, but was the same one parked outside 3636 on Google Maps. 
making it the vehicle of one of the boy's friends, or former friends. Someone who'd come to visit them in August 2015. Someone who drove the getaway vehicle in December 2016. Perhaps the vehicle of one of these three. I'm just spitballing scenarios. Man, this one right here, man, there's so many different scenarios and different what ifs, and it could be this, could be that. It's starting to make my goddamn head hurt, y'all. Seriously, man. As there's very little footage to work with, and few theories being discussed online, but given that Suspect 1 let the fence of a property so far from 3636, I'm confident that there was at least some confusion in the aftermath of the massacre. Unlike the POI in Scott Radigan's case, I don't believe these people are particularly intelligent. They'd be in their thirties now, and I'd wager that in all that time, at least one of them has talked about this event to somebody, maybe bragged about how they robbed homes in the South Ogden area in their twenties. Unfortunately, the investigation into this case has stagnated, and the police are still hesitant to release more information to avoid compromising the case. Though Kevin Nelson was likely in the wrong place at the wrong time, Investigators remain confident that the three perps knew either Carl Van Koeman or one of his housemates, and were prepared to end their lives for material gain. They also believe that someone must know who they are, or at least have some information to share. If that's you, you've been silent for seven and a half years. Mm. It's time to speak up. You don't owe True. these people anything, but you do owe Carl and Kevin's families the truth. True. Help bring them closure by contacting the South Ogden PD. You can even do so anonymously at southogdencity.com. The information you share, however small, could be the lead detectives are waiting for. Prior to Carl's slaying, his father JJ would leave the family's porch light on until all of his younger children were home. Now they want it left on all the time for Kyle. To this day, they won't let us turn the light off, said JJ. So I'm hoping that once this is solved, that porch light can be turned off. Yeah, my brothers and sisters, we just went down some freaking rabbit holes. I'm telling you, man, this last one, the, the last one that we just watched, it got me just thinking it could have been this, it could have been that, it could have been this, it could have been that. Like, it's so many different ways you can look at that one. And shout out to the lazy man, like I said, man, for bringing these two cases to light. And I understand why he was saying, like, that um, hopefully him bringing these cases to light can help help us uh figure out who the freak was doing this to these uh people. People. Rest in peace to all those uh, people that lost their lives in these two cases, man. And um, I will say, just being honest, the second one, I feel like that one it will... The, well, let's just say it like this. The first one has a better chance of being solved than the second one. But here come the weird part with the second one. And it's crazy that I would say that because the second one is clearly, at the very least three people involved in those murders you know what i'm saying we literally can see them on camera scoping out this house around this house and all that uh hiding behind trees and stuff you know what i'm saying it was three of them and for to this day none of them have slipped up and told anybody or even if they have nobody has told us like it ain't just one person that could slip up and start telling man back in you know what i'm saying i did this with did, did, you know what i'm saying we have seen it plenty of time how these killers slip up and start telling on themselves but None of these have, man. They ain't told on themselves. They ain't told on the other people. They they keeping it quiet. Now, I do feel like if the police could get any type of evidence where they can bring one of these people in and be like, we know that's you. And I do feel like one of them was a female, the one with the, uh, the black pants on. I think that was a female. So let's just say the police do get some kind of evidence where they can tie her to it and they bring her in that's when i feel like the beans gonna get spilled and she gonna tell who the other two people was you know what i'm saying man but it's still like a hit and i really don't know who the freak did it but shout out to the lazy man for doing all that freaking research that he did to find out that um the the, the third camera didn't even come from the uh next door neighbor house it was a house on the next street over you know what i'm saying so shout out lazy man for that but like i said unsolved mystery rest in peace of them then the first one i ain't finna go down all this y'all with this one man it's just it's crazy man like this one right here is one of the ones well i'm pretty freaking confident whoever that was and i think this was a male 
on that CCTV CCTV footage with the pigeon toe walking and running. It was a male and he knew what he was doing and I think he knew Scott and it, it, it was just a hit, man. Both of these was two freaking hits and I, I think we may find out who that was, maybe, and I keep going back to the pigeon toe thing, but that stands out so much. Not a lot of people run or walk like that. That's an easy one to figure out, even if you got all your face covered up and your mask and all that, all that, all that. But I digress. I'm going to go on and let y'all go now, bro. Oh, my brothers and sisters. We have been here long enough, being team. I appreciate y'all coming on back as always. And before y'all leave, just please, 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 please hit that like button, comment, subscribe, and do all that if you ain't did that yet. And come on back tomorrow for another That Chapter Wednesday. But until then, my friends, also remember this. Love, peace, and happiness. Stay safe. Don't stop. Keep going. Yeah.